Victor Kiros is a top agent in our Inland Empire office in Ontario. He does a magnificent job in terms of farming, which candidly is not a rarity, but the minority of agents use this method to be able to communicate how to do business. You know, rejection from a letter is very, very small. Rejection from a phone call is larger, but not nearly as large as perhaps knocking on someone's door. So I really admire him for that. He's a young man going places, has a tremendous amount of energy, and the self-discipline to make this business work. He's got a fascinating background, and I'd like you to listen carefully as he talks about what he did with his life before he came into our business. Victor, please, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Bruce. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak with you and share with our agents and other people who might be considering our company as far as what I do. Um, well, about me, uh, I can tell you real estate wasn't my first career, Bruce. Um, actually, uh, let me re rephrase that. It was my first career. I had two jobs before then. Um, in 1998, fresh out of high school, my first job was with the United Parcel Service, UPS. It was a part-time job and I was going to school in the daytime, so I worked in the evenings unloading those brown package cars that we see driving around every yes. day. And I realized very quickly that was not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life, um, regardless of the pension and retirement plan and full benefits they offered, and stability almost. Uh, it's not what I wanted to do. I moved on from there and got a job with uh, Mercedes-Benz USA and the Chrysler Group. At the time it was Daimler Chrysler, and that was in 1999. I got a job there, so I left UPS, and again, I, I knew that it's not really what I wanted to do, but it was a bridge to some place I hadn't figured out uh, how to cross that bridge yet or where, where it was even leading to. But um, in 2000, I was 19 years old, Mercedes-Benz told us in Southern California, hey, we're opening up a new facility in Northern California, and if you young guys don't go, you're at risk of being laid off. So at 19 years old, I had a choice. You know, stay here in Southern California, where I grew up at, around my friends and family, or move 700 miles away to the Bay Area, where I know nobody and start basically a fresh life. Uh, luckily for me, uh, you know, I didn't have anything holding me back here, so I took the opportunity and I went to the Bay Area and uh, you know, started working for Mercedes-Benz. They provided me with relocation funds. You know, I had a steady job and, and I even got accepted to a school up there, Bruce. But the one thing I didn't have moving up there was a place to live. So uh, I ended up going to a couple of different apartment complexes and taking my dad with me. And uh, you know, he was a little bird in my ear. On the drive back, you know it's a six hour drive from San Francisco to Los Angeles. You're moving fast, six We're hours. We're moving fast, <laughs> yeah. They, they gave us basically two and a half months notice. You know, I believe it was uh, the end of November that uh, they told us we had to go to Northern California or risk being laid off, and we had to report there at the beginning of February. So we had all of December, all of January to make the move happen. But uh, for me it was, you know, a, difficult decision but not too difficult I made it but I remember seeing those apartments with my dad and on the drive back uh, he was driving I was in the passenger seat and he starts to tell me about the benefits of home ownership and he kept trying to talk me out of renting this one bedroom one bathroom apartment I believe it was going for 700 bucks a month or so and then you're 19 years old I'm 19 years old yeah. I'm about to be 20 but I was 19 at the time and he tells me you know just look into getting a home loan see if they'll even give you one and, and explore the idea of buying something before you start throwing your money away into an apartment that you're never going to get a write-off for you're never going to get any appreciation or equity and you know at 19 years old i didn't know anything about real estate but i looked into it i contacted my credit union they pre-approved me for a minimal loan I, I should tell you but i used that loan to buy a two-bedroom one and a half bathroom condo at the age of 19. good for you so at 19 now i'm living 700 miles away from my friends and family. I have a decent job, I'm going to school, and now I have my own condo. I didn't know it yet, Bruce, but that was my first experience with real estate, and that was the path that I've chosen to take with my life. Right, you know, it's interesting. You may know this already, but UPS, the drivers do not make any left-hand turns. They always turn right. Yeah. And you made the right turn, candidly, when you got into the real estate business, but there are some parallels between you I left England when I was 18, traveled 12,500 miles away to New Zealand. The point is, that plan that you had to go to San Francisco, 
matured you. It, it really brought you out of a straitjacket of conformity. I found when I got to New Zealand, I had to make a new circle of friends, which meant I had to reach out to people. And then I came to California, I went through the same process. You had to go through that process. And to me, from the standpoint of you being in San Francisco, that was a tremendous learning experience for you, an education, because you had to start over. Many, many people don't take that opportunity. They don't take that chance. I admire you because you did. Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, it was it, a learning experience. It, well, it, it, it is. A, a question I have for you. You now, how, long, how many years have you been in our business now? Well, uh, when I was in San Francisco, um, I was working nights for Mercedes-Benz, and I was going to school in the daytime. So it really wasn't a whole lot of time to make friends. But what I was interested in was real estate. I caught the bug when I bought my first property. Yes, obviously. Yeah, and, and I actually started my licensing classes with Remax there in the Bay Area. And um, I didn't That's finish. Brand X, isn't it? Yeah, Brand Just X, teasing. I'm sorry. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> uh, I started there with a different franchise just to get my, you know, uh, classes out of the way so I can get my license and start selling. It never materialized. Instead of finishing up my classes, what I ended up doing was I, I became a de facto assistant to one of the agents there. I started to learn all the back office systems, marketing techniques, you know, how to put a file together, you know, all the disclosures, reports, and um, contracts and things like that. Uh, but I never sold a house. So in the daytime I was going to school, I was a part-time realtor's assistant, and I had a full-time job at night. Well, you see, from my point of view, you took a shortcut. You took a shortcut to success. You know, there's a lot of people in this world now are saying that a four-year college education is a waste of time for many people. And in your particular case, by getting indirectly into the business, you you, you quick started your program. That's my point. Of view. Absolutely correct. Now, as a new agent, and I ask you this from your viewpoint, if you were training a brand new agent right now and you were talking to that agent, giving advice, let's say, what would that agent do in the first month in business? What should they do? Well, Bruce, as you know, I train a lot of the new agents at our Ontario branch, so I'm a mentor there. And I deal with new agents all the time. One of the advantages that I had as a new agent, as a new sales agent, versus some of the new agents and licensees who come in to the building and looking for mentorship, is I did two and a half years of back office work. I knew the contracts, I knew how to work in MLS. Remember the old super keys where you'd actually have to oh, lock yes. it in and then punch the code? Yes. I was dealing with those. Never sales, but all the back office systems I already knew, so I had a little bit of an advantage. And, and I remind the new agents and licensees of my background, and it's gonna be different for them, because they have no experience in real estate sales whatsoever. And uh, what I always remind them is, face-to-face -face is the number one way to get business, whether it's from your sphere of influence or from the general public, somebody you don't know already. So I always tell them you're gonna you're gonna ask for business from all of your center of influence initially because they know you, they like you, hopefully they trust you enough to give you a deal or two. You know, the people out there in the general public don't know you and they're gonna feed off of your inexperience. And they're gonna be a little bit wary about giving a brand new agent uh, you know, half a million dollar deal because that's a lot of money and a lot of responsibilities to work with. So I tell them Try to get face-to-face -face as much as possible with your sphere of influence. And then once you exhaust all those uh, you know, people and they're not buying from you or selling through you, you got to go out there and meet the general public. One of the easiest ways for a brand new agent to meet somebody who's interested in real estate that they don't know, Bruce, I believe, open houses. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can hold an open house. I, I couldn't agree with you. Eight hours of Saturday, eight hours on Sunday, and treat it as a retail store. Anybody who walks in, whether it be the neighbors or uh, some looky-loo is interested in real estate and it gives them an opportunity to sharpen their skills and practice the art of uh, selling. It's lessening the stress for people coming to them too. I think there are some people who take it further than that and hold open house on weekdays from That's 3 true. to 5. It's particularly good in spring and summer. Yes, yes it is. But, and it doesn't take very much money. Most new agents coming into this industry of ours have very little capital. Yeah. And you've just given a couple of ideas. It's interesting you talk about sphere of influence. I've learned in my life that people really don't care within reason how much you know, but they do want to know how much you care for them. I think if you're a reasonably intelligent person, you can learn quickly what the answers are to questions. But you're so right. Everyone has moms and dads, uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, cousins, 
nieces and nephews, people they grew up with, socialized with, worship with, work with. That's a tremendous amount of people to communicate with. It's like a wedding party of 200 people. But the key is to get out and communicate to them that you are the person to do the job. Victor, you've had a tough day prospecting. You've had your share of rejection, okay? How do you handle that in terms of recharging the battery? So you're not consumed by the rejection. I know you wouldn't be anyway, but advice to someone perhaps who's been in the business less time than you, how do you handle it? Uh, Bruce, uh, let me ask you this. If you're asking me how I handle rejection, when yes. I get hung up on the phone or somebody closes the door in my face and tells me to get off their property? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, when I was a brand new agent, I, I took it personally. I didn't have the right mindset. I thought they were rejecting me or uh, my style of interpreting the communication. I just didn't think I had it. They weren't rejecting you, they were rejecting the proposition. Correct. You and separate I, yourself. Yes, and I figured that out as I matured in the business. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that really sticks with me and hopefully our agents out there and other uh, people watching this can take and learn. So I was in a coaching program for a full year, real estate coaching, and one of the things that they had did was they pulled all of their coaching clients and they had them surveyed and figured out what their prospecting habits were. They found that their average coaching client got 49.2 no's before they received one yes. So I looked at that and I thought 49.2 no's equals one yes. My average commission check is $10,000. I did the math. I divide that 49.2 into $10,000 and it turns out that each no was worth a little bit over $200 to me. Thank so, you for the no. So, so now, exactly, so now when somebody tells me no, thank you, they're not interested in buying or selling at this time, yeah. I smile, I shake their hand or you know, say thank you very much for their time over the phone. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that no just made me $200 because it got me closer to that one yes. It'd be fun to say and thank you for the $200. It would be. That might create some additional conversation that might turn it around for you. Might say it under my breath. but uh, I've, I've got a quick story for you. Tom Hopkins is a longtime friend. Like you, at the age of 19, he got involved in that business. He tells the story of knocking on doors one day, knocking on the front door. The lady was rude to him, closed the door on his face. He's walking down the driveway, scratching his head. I can't let this lady ruin my day emotionally. He turns around, goes up the driveway, turns left, goes around to the back door, knocks on the back door. Lady comes to the back and she says, ma'am, the lady at the front of the house is seeming to have a bad day today. Could I ask what kind of day you're having? She laughed into the house, coffee. He swears he eventually sold that piece of property. And it takes a certain kind of personality to be able to do that. You talked about the door being slammed in your face. I'll guarantee, I know I'm guessing, but it's a good guess, with that smile on your face the door, there's not very many doors that are closing your face. That's true. I mean, it's just a numbers game. And again, when it does happen, it's very rare, but it does. I don't take it personally. I thank them in the back of my head for their $200 no, and I move on to the next one. Right. And the next question is, what do you believe your greatest strength is in this business? Uh, um, well, it's not something that I can sell or even uh, give you. It's something that my clients feel. Um, my fiduciary responsibility. I take that very seriously. Um, and it's maybe a little bit different from the approach that most agents or realtors take because this is a sales job. Our job is to sell houses, help people buy and sell real estate, correct? I don't approach it that way when I'm meeting with somebody. I approach it from a service standpoint, Bruce. I really look at the family and their situation. I understand their motivation for wanting to buy or sell something and I try to make sure that all of their needs are met because I know this, even though we're in sales, I don't believe I can talk somebody into spending half a million dollars on a home. They didn't already have an internal motivation or desire to purchase in the first place. So they have hopes and dreams before I came into the picture. My job is to make sure that they achieve their goals and the deal is as beneficial to them as possible and uh, that's regardless of my commission check or whatnot. So. Um, that, I believe, resonates with my clients. I think they feel it when we meet and talk. You know, the genuineness of me wanting to help them versus me wanting to make a sale is the difference, I believe. Well, I, I'm hearing that you're creating loyalty in them, too, by really getting to know who they are. There's an old acronym of yours, F-O-R-D. It's not an SUV yes. from Detroit. Yeah. Family, occupation, recreation, dreams. dreams. 
getting to know them through that process is, right. is very, very valuable. Indeed. And I wanted to hit on something. You kept talking about 500,000 other transactions. Now, in the Inland Empire, candidly, the average market price is almost half that amount. But you've done something that I thought was kind of spectacular. You took the time to do a tremendous amount of research, and you found the high end in the Inland Empire. And you've cultivated that high end, which simply means, in my mind, that one transaction is like two transactions for you. Right. Uh, and you've created a farm system there that just won't quit. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Because I know that you're on video as well, and you communicate to your people through constant new little vignettes on the video. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, with my farm system, um, what I did was, uh, instead of you know mailing out postcards that say, just listed or just sold, or I'm the best number one realtor in the area, what I decided to do was add something of value. Um, I've realized over the years that there's lots of agents and, and brokerages who brag about being number one in a particular place, but that doesn't do anything for the consumer or the homeowner. What I did was I created a farm system to where uh, in full color I put big maps of the neighborhood on paper and every month I put little pinpoints with the just listed uh, pending properties and the sold properties. I give them all of the data, you know, the addresses, the amount of bedrooms, bathrooms, uh, square footage, days on the market, what type of sale it is, and ultimately what the uh, price point was for each property. And I give them a snapshot, letting them know what their neighborhood's worth. It gives them value because, unfortunately, in our business, a lot of the agents don't stay in contact with their past clients. You know, everybody gets a monthly bank statement, right? You get a quarterly statement from your financial planner and you probably see the doctor or dentist once or twice a year, but nobody hears from the realtor unless it's a, hey, come buy or sell for me marketing style piece. So I decided to give my two farm areas, you know, the, the snapshot every month of what their neighborhood is doing as far as price values, gains, uh, you know, uh, decreases in values, days on market. And I found that in my farm area, sometimes when I get called to go on a listing presentation, the homeowner has four, or five, maybe even six months of my marketing pieces saved up in a folder because they've been watching what the market's doing and I've been the one providing them that information. Without them contacting me initially, they've been watching what I've been doing, they've been saving the valuable information in regards to neighborhood values that I've been giving them and, and they keep it and ultimately when they decide to sell, you know, I'm the, the first thing that pops to their mind. Well, you've kept them up to speed and you've made them knowledgeable, and there's almost a moral obligation on their part to return the favor. I mean, that's what I would think. Okay, which brings me to the next question. If I'm a seller, why should I put my property in the market with you? I have an outstanding, an outstanding 12-point marketing system. We take high-quality photography, we take uh, high-definition video. Photography, for what purpose? What do you do with the photography? Well, we use it for our marketing pieces. We cover all of the media where any home buyer would be at. We're talking internet, video sites, mailers, magazines, newspapers, flyers. I employ a call center. All they do is call around neighborhoods talking about the listings that I have. We do open houses. We do a multitude of things to bring as many buyers as possible to see the house. Because the more buyers who see the house, the more offers we get. The more offers we get, the higher price we get. The higher price we get, the more of a profit my clients can take with them after the close of the transaction. So um, my marketing system is the best, really. And, and I have to compliment you on your videos, too. Uh, you're very personable. Uh, you're in a position where you're giving new material all the time. It's not dated. And it's short enough where they're not going to have an attention deficit problem yeah. in terms of what you communicate. That's true. In talking about the technology and that you mentioned to me recently some apps that you use. What apps are you using with your clients that are your favorite apps? I have a couple of them, Bruce. Um, number one app that I use, and everybody has it on their smartphone, is the Google Calendar. Without the calendar, I wouldn't be able to spread out my day or even week. I plan ahead a lot, and without planning ahead and time blocking, my business would be in, in disarray. So it has to be organized some way. Google Calendar is the number one app that I use. Um, I would also tell you that uh, cloud storage, Google Drive or iCloud, Dropbox, something like those applications, they allow me to take all of my files with me on the go through the touch of a, an application on my smartphone. 
So literally, I've you know been in Hawaii on the beach, and I have an open escrow, and they need a document. I can pull up my smartphone, tap, 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 and the, the document is sent off. So I don't need to be at the office or carrying around 30 files in my car. Everything is on a cloud and it's accessible via phone. You're talking about time management taken to the nth degree. Yeah. What's the highest and best use of your time? I guess you're always asking that question. I love the expression, do it, delegate it, or ditch it. I think you reach the stage where you know when to delegate it and when to ditch it to make your time the most valuable. You've learned, as I have, that our life in this business is filled with non-scheduled interruptions. Correct. But buying proper prior planning prevents poor performance. By doing all this time management, it gives you the flexibility to be able to adjust your day. Yes, that's definitely. fabulous. How do you maintain, you've got a very busy life, how do you maintain a balance in your life? Well, how do I maintain a balance? Wow, well, um, again, Google Calendar. Uh, it's, it's the number one thing for me because I can block out chunks of time throughout my day or week and specify them for either uh, you know, prospecting activities, um, you know, administrative work, or personal me time, you know, which is family time. You make, it's interesting when you say personal me time, you treat that just like a top priority and you put it in your calendar as a time element involved in that particular day. Yes, I do. I do because I'll tell you, if I don't... It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. <laughs> okay. And you know very well in this business, yeah. If you have the stamina too, you can work 24-7. There's always more to do. There's never, it's never going to be complete. It's never going to be 100%. But that's, you know, the business. And, and I understand that. So I do time block out, you know, my, my personal time. And even lunch with mom, I got to get her, you know, two or three days ahead of time. And mom, I'm putting you in for this hour and a half. You know, my mom doesn't do half an hour lunches. She does an hour and a half or so. Um, so I got to time block that out. Also, um, you know, our business is very stressful sometimes because we're dealing with uh, high dollar volume and uh, ultimately the, well, the welfare and well-being of a family and, and the roof over their head. So those nights when uh, I can't really get some sleep or anything like that, um, I, I exercise, I practice martial arts. It's uh, oh. Krav Maga. That's, with your customers? I'm just teasing. No, not with my customers, <laughs> only the tough ones, you know. But uh, Krav Maga, it's, it's Israeli contact combat and I do that a couple times a week. That allows me to get some, you know, pent up stress out in a positive way. You know, I, I stay fit and uh, you know really learn the system. It's a, it's a great thing and um, it's something that I really I've been doing it for a long time. I really enjoy it. You mentioned your mom. I, as a matter, I'm having lunch with my mother today. She's 93 years of age. I've met her before. Yes. Yeah, she's losing her eyesight at her but not her opinions. Yeah. And we always learn from my parents, don't we? Um, let me ask you this question. Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is reputed to be the third richest man in the whole world. The company made $19.5 billion last year. He's bringing this tremendous strength to our real estate industry. In fact, the brand was voted the most valuable brand this year. Right. And last uh, week's edition of the National Magazine back page indicated that. How do you use Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett to help your business? Well, um, since we've changed over from Prudential California Realty into Berkshire Hathaway Home Services uh, earlier this year, I found either my clients are wowed by the fact that I work for Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and we're affiliated with Warren Buffett, or I found that they have no idea who Berkshire Hathaway is. Now, when I was in Northern California, as I told you, I kind of dabbled in real estate and a couple of other, th other things. I did some financial stuff. I have an insurance license. I don't use it because I don't like the, the career particularly. But I found that people in that you know financial realm really respect it. They're wild. It's actually gotten me in the doors on a couple of listing presentations. When they heard the, the name Berkshire Hathaway, they were you know immediately said, like Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, come on over. So either people are really wowed by the fact or they have no clue. But I don't believe the name is the ultimate selling tool for us. That's going to help us get in the door. But you got to be, you know, the professional salesperson, the professional real estate resource to close the deal. You're so right on. Uh, I, I think one of the things I've learned is you can't pick up a newspaper, a magazine, watch TV, or listen to radio without seeing at least Warren Buffett's name mentioned yeah. almost on a daily basis tied into Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, and it allows us, you know, an avenue to be somewhat, you know, in conjunction with them, and, and people are impressed by that, if they know the name. 
you have a big event about to take place in your life, and I won't get into the details, but um, on your bucket list, you're too young to have a bucket list, there's so many things for you to be able oh, to do. Oh, I have a goal list. I do. Um, right let now. me ask you this. If you had a dream vacation, where would you go? A dream vacation? Yeah. Unlimited funds. Unlimited uh, in other words, you had an opportunity to do something specific in terms of taking a vacation. Where would you go? Wow, I've been all over the world already. Um, I would have to say, uh, I would I would love to, to explore med more of the Mediterranean. Uh, I really would. Um, that's something that's you know on my list of things to do. and, and uh, I'll get around to it in the next three or four years. You know, that's a, that's a goal of mine. And um, you know, lots of people have dreams. Uh, that's great for them. I take those dreams, put them on paper, and they're goals. So, you know, the next couple of years, I will send you a postcard from uh, somewhere good, on the you know, eastern you. coast of Mediterranean. Uh, yeah. You get to Italy. Italy's I've been. A fabulous place. I've been to Italy already. Yeah, and uh, the islands of Malta and Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean. Haven't been yet but I would love to go check them out. Yeah. Yeah. See, the best thing about being in our business is uh, there's no limit to what you can do in terms of income. Yeah. And if you have the ambition and the drive that you have, uh, you can go anywhere at any time to accomplish that objective. Any final thoughts? Any thoughts that you might want to express in reference to you, your future, or advice you can give to someone else? Now, this is my career, and I, I'm not leaving. Anytime soon, I'm staying in the industry, and and with that mindset, I'm willing to do still, even though I'm a veteran, I'm willing to do what it takes to push myself to that next level, you know. And I know that as a new agent, I started off a little bit different than some of my mentees have, but it's a it's a growing process. A lot of people watch HGTV and Million Dollar Listing, and they say, hey, we can do this job. And they don't understand. There's a lot of background work that goes into it. I mean, houses aren't sold in a 30 minute television segment. It takes lots of time, lots of effort, and uh, I'm happy that my sphere of influence, friends and family have embraced what I do. They trust me as a real estate professional, and, and I've grown a lot with their help and, and with the help of the company here as well. Well, you know, reflecting upon our conversation this morning, and again, I don't mean to patronize you, but I believe your greatest skill is your negotiating ability, and that will get you wherever you want to go. And I certainly appreciate the time we've invested together today. Yes, Bruce. Thank, Thank you. you very much.